a deep welcome to all of you. Um, my name is Meski Mabazion. I um, I've been with uh, practicing with Common Ground for about 12, 15 years. I lost track. Um, and uh, I think a couple of a couple of years ago, I I I don't know, maybe possibly 2019, I did graduate from uh, Common Ground Dharma Leadership Training to share the Dharma. Um, so, so along with Common Ground co-guiding teachers, Shelley Graf and Mark Numberg, we warmly welcome you and deeply welcome you in this uh, freezing day in Minnesota and wherever you may be from. Uh, so our reflection in this uh, Living the Practice workshops related to Dukkha and the freedom from Dukkha. I think the first step in, uh, in this study is, is recognizing there is Dukkha. There is suffering in this life. There is stress and being interested and showing up in a workshop like this, that's, you know, 50% of the solution. So um, your intention to be here um, to practice um, is part of how the part of the path to freedom. Um, what can we say about dukkha? It, it's not a topic that, you know, that's unfamiliar. You know, when we look in our own lives, especially the last couple of years, whether it's the pandemic or, you know, civil unrest or whatever it may be, it's been so in the forefront, upfront in our lives. Even if we choose to ignore it, it's it's a topic that keeps coming back and would not <laughs> would not go away. Um, as some of you may know, um, um, Thich Nhat Han, a spiritual father to you know many students of the Buddha passed away yesterday. Um, and that's, uh, you know, dukkha in a sense. Uh, but I, I just wanna bring um, his efforts, his practice, his um, teachings and all ancestors that have come before us just to bring him into this space and to honor him. Um, and just uh, what a great way to spend the day practicing for a Buddha of a lifetime in this own lifetime, in his own rights. Those of you who may not know him, you can look it up. So I can't even say enough things about him. And maybe we could just sprinkle a few teachings of his during the day. Um, so... our practice or our learning from the suffering in our own lives, in our own hearts, um, directly here and now, you know, how it is forming, how it is repeating itself and how it could be released would be the exploration that we will continue throughout the day. We will have Dharma talks, group discussions, um, small groups um, throughout the day from all three of us. Um, and I encourage all of you to maybe drop in a word or a phrase in the chat 
where that comes up either about freedom from dukkha or the recognition of the truth of dukkha itself. So I'll give it about a minute or so, what may resonate with you and that comes up. It could also be the intention why you showed up today. So just feel free to drop, to drop in a word or a phrase um, in the chat. Teacher, being aware, not fine, yeah, I love that, accepting. And resistance, freedom, allowing, release. Open heart, equanimity. Recognition, recognition. Openness. Loss. Mm. So they make, this makes me really happy. I, I don't, I mean, I think we are just, all of us together are, sharing the teachings, but look at all this wisdom flowing in the chat. This itself, recognizing dukkha is freedom in part. So we're gonna continue this reflection throughout the day. I appreciate all of you for joining us um, and thank you for the wisdom. I wanna invite Mark and Shelly to say a few words if there's anything that I didn't mention before we move on to the next um, section, which will be, we will do a sit. So Mark or Shelly, anything else to add? Nothing to add, so I'll just, um, as Meski said, introduce the next part. Uh, Mark is going to lead us in a, a short chant, and then we'll go right into the meditation. So you can just settle into the posture for meditation now. And you probably have seen, I've just put into the chat, many of you know this chant. And uh, of course, we'll all be mute, uh, muted, but uh, please uh, consider at least reading along as I chant. And then also you might consider chanting out loud. It's uh, part of what we're doing today is just normalizing our human experience that we share that Life is unreliable, unpredictable, uncontrollable, uncertain, insecure. This isn't really so much a problem as much as uh, just integrating the, the truth of our lives that we share. And this chant that the Buddha recommends we do frequently, this reflection that we do frequently, we generally refer to as the five remembrances, if you're unfamiliar with it. So take a look and let's do this together. I'll ring the bell. You can use this gesture if you like. It's called Anjali, but you know, it's it's kind of a human gesture. It's not specific to Buddhism, of course. Just like this is something I care about. So, but don't feel like you have to, but I'm gonna do it. Okay. So here we go. Five subjects for frequent recollection. 
I am of the nature to age. <clears throat> I have not gone beyond aging. I am of the nature to sicken. I have not gone beyond sickness. I am of the nature to die. I have not gone beyond dying. All that is mine, beloved and pleasing, will become otherwise, will become separated from me. I am the owner of my karma, heir to my karma, born of my karma, related to my karma, abide supported by my karma. Whatever karma I shall do, for good or for ill, of that I will be the heir. <clears throat> Thus we should frequently recollect. Pass it back to Shelley now. inviting the words to settle into the heart as we make any final adjustments to the posture. inviting some embodied balance even simply in the posture once we found a, a place for the body to land for the next half an hour we can just feel the uprightness the alertness balanced with some ease and relaxation. Simple way to begin, but powerful not to neglect even the simplest of moments. Noticing what happens when we remember that we have a body. There's not so much of a doing to try to find the body that needs to happen. but just in remembering that there is a body it becomes possible to connect right here where all life happens
And however we are able to locate the body is good. We might feel the weight of the body, the heaviness, pressure on the sits bones. Or maybe temperature, the relative warmth or coolness. Perhaps there are places of tension that pop out right away. And call the attention here. Or maybe even movement of energy, tingling, pulsating, or something like this. We can remember that we don't have to go and find sensations. They're here. The body's right here. We simply intend to connect. We might even Notice the breath. The breath, a force of nature all its own. Responding naturally. With its own rhythm. Flowing in and out of the body. We can invite a connection here. Inviting an intimacy with the breath. A sensitivity to the felt sense of breathing. And remembering that there's no need to try to control a force of nature such as the breath. The breath is just doing what it does 
moving, changing. Responding. Is it possible to just allow the breath to be the breath? Without trying to make it different or better. And we can tune into that, that kind of peace or ease or perhaps even relief, not to have to be somebody, not to have to do anything, but just accept this force of nature on its own terms. Uh, the breath is like this. What a relief not to have to change it. I simply connect and care. And the, the caring heart is expressed in a willingness to keep returning to the breath. I care enough to come back and reconnect as often as needed. Connecting and returning, an expression of intimacy, an expression of the heart that cares, allowing, what a relief not to have to do anything but this. We'll continue in silence now.
Feel free to take a minute to stretch or stand or even move away from your screen if you'd like to do that. As we begin an exploration of dukkha at any point in time, it's always it's always good to know how to soothe soothe the heart, right? Before we jump into the deep end, we want to we want to know how we can get out. And so, hopefully, if um, hopefully the meditation was a good reminder of one way to to soothe the the heart that's really on fire. Right, to know how to benefit from seclusion, to benefit from the kind of uh, dropping or setting down all of the, the thinking mind for in moments at least, and just returning to the simple um, anchor like the breath. It doesn't have to be the breath. We, we used the breath this morning, but um, if that doesn't work for you, it could be sound or just a general sense of the body can work. Even listening to a nice song like we did right at the beginning, right? Can be a way of just allowing the mind to really feel the power of the music or the good feeling that's there with the music. Yeah. And chanting can be another way of just of just allowing our hearts just giving ourselves over to the activity of chanting, to the to the power of the words, even, you know, if we don't, it's like sometimes chanting can be really powerful to me and I'm not trying to remember the words or trying to connect deeply with the words, but just to trust that there's something happening with, as I utter the words. Right. So over the next few hours, well, more than that. <laughs> Throughout the day, Meski and Mark and I will be using the Four Noble Truths as a kind of guide to help us um, understand and relate wisely to Dukkha. And dukkha is this Pali word for that, that points to the unsatisfactoriness of experience. It can often be translated as suffering. It's really pointing to something a little bit, I think, uh, beyond uh, a single word. Actually, I like the word dukkha more than any other word or phrase because it, it feels um, complete, right? And in the uh, description of the first noble truth, the Buddha, the, the, the Buddha really talked about suffering in such a pragmatic way, like just making the statement that there is suffering in this life, right? There's just, there's going to be suffering. It's almost like, well, there's a sky and there's trees and there's a body and there's this bell, you know, just statements of fact that are, are hard to dispute. And we can learn about suffering. We can learn about dukkha. We can understand it deeply and to, to, to kind of start to understand uh, how this happens right? And in part, as we do that, we learn that we have to accept dukkha, right? There's no sense in trying to fight the reality any more than there would be in, there's any sense in fighting that there's snow on the ground. It doesn't make any sense, right? There's just snow on the ground right now, if you're in Minnesota, at least. And so to accept that dukkha is what we get to work with, what we get to learn from, can be a really powerful starting place. At least it has been for me. Like, oh, there's not something wrong with me. You know, there's not something, I'm not somehow off the path if I notice suffering. I'm actually supposed to notice suffering. That's how I learn, right? That's how we learn. So the, the move with dukkha is to, is to be willing to be intimate and it's through this connection and willingness to be intimate training, this training that we do to get close to those places in our hearts where we feel tension, any kind of constriction, tension, tightness, right? We might not even know 
why, but we just feel a little off or this doesn't feel right. There could be, there's something here that I don't quite, I can't quite put my finger on. That can be an experience of dukkha. And this, this training that we do to, in really ordinary ways, to, to cultivate the habit of awareness, the wise and loving habit of awareness, allows us to get close to these aspects of truth that we often don't feel courageous enough to. So take any of the reactive habits of mind, anger, fear, jealousy, rage, grief, right? It's not, um, when I imagine being an angry person, I don't feel excited about being close to anger. And in, in fact, I feel a little bit scared of it, right? The cognitive mind that wants to imagine anger is very different than the heart that knows how to connect and is willing to accept any experience as its object. So this is the power of mindfulness. Mindfulness or mindful awareness has no preferences. It's like a mirror. Its job is just to reflect what's already here, right? So as we cultivate this capacity, this renewing capacity to be in our life, to be with ourselves and each other, to be connected, then, then that capacity grows regardless of the object or the experience that's there, right? So that's why the cognitive mind that can imagine what a hell realm it might be to be angry, and that might not be untrue, but it's very different than the experience of being intimate with anger, for example, right? It's actually, my experience has been that the heart knows how to be courageous. It's just because we've been cultivating this habit to connect that it feels, it starts to, it starts to, the, the faith that comes in, in knowing that there isn't a better way to live. Uh, sensitivity is really the only way to live, right? And we can check this out with, you know, we've all had experiences that in our previously, but also probably pretty regularly of denying or blaming or, you know, these hearts, the heart's natural defense mechanisms, they show up all the time for us. And those experiences of dukkha, when we feel them, when we feel the heart that's blaming, right? we know oh, this isn't the way to go. That blame isn't the way to go. And yet the willingness to connect with blame is there as well, right? And so then nothing becomes off limits in our life. It's so beautiful. Like our whole life, every single moment of our life becomes the biggest canvas for learning, right? We don't have to somehow um, fabricate barriers and borders in order to be happy. We can learn to be easeful and to be happy no matter what's happening. And the way that we do that, when the support for being able to be in these complicated moments where life feels hard, or we feel the power of the mind uh, relating unskillfully to experience, is by understanding something about nature. Yeah. It's hard to, it's hard to be with dukkha without that understanding, right? The pain or the constriction in the heart that arises in relationship to experience can only really be allowed because we understand, oh, this isn't mine. There's no sense in trying to own this. Oh, look at the heart that wants to own this. That's painful, right? So instead the move is, ah, I just let this move. Why not just be intimate? Why not just feel it? Why not just let this move? And there's so many ways to um, feel into the impersonal nature of things. I've been sick as many of you, I'm in the COVID I'm now in the COVID club, 
I've had my, <laughs> I've had at least one um, experience with COVID and I'm, I'm feeling quite well now. And it wasn't, you know, uh, I was almost going to say it wasn't severe, but one of the things that I've been noticing is that the narrative around being sick is so limited, right? These words like mild and severe sort of uh, paint us into a, a corner to sort of, to have to understand what that means in a very limited way. And so realizing at, as, a, as the body wasn't well and the energy was not, that not that great and you know there was not a great capacity for productivity all of the dukkha around illness and many of you in this room probably have um, lots of experience with illness as human beings always do right? and so the feeling into these moments when there was tension in the heart about oh i should be doing more but I don't feel enough energy right now, and maybe I'm making it up that there's not enough energy. Maybe there actually is more energy. Let me check. Oh, now I'm tired. And just the narrative, the views and beliefs that are inherited <laughs> from so many places, right? From the media, from, you know, what's seen and, okay, this is a mild case which means it's like a cold, which means when we have a cold, we should just do all the things that we normally do, right? Or, you know, many other ways that we absorb narrative and take it for truth, such as we should, you know, there should be some shame in being sick. All these, this kind of discussion about wellness you know, then begs the question, well, should I be, is there something wrong with me if I allowed myself to get sick or something like that? Who's to fall? Who's, that, who's to blame? It must be me or somebody else. Let's figure that out. So in these really powerful, very ordinary moments, you know, without practice, without cultivating this habit of awareness to, to meet any even mundane experience, it wouldn't even be possible to see all of that. And to be able to feel into it and feel the pain of it like oh wow look at all this these thoughts and beliefs these views that flow through the mind can hardly be noticed sometimes you know they're so subtle they're just not mine they've been inherited they've been inherited pr from previous moments from communities from relationships right from narrative that we hear it's just like floating in the ether and so is it possible to seek a deeper kind of wisdom that sees that a little more clearly? And the beginning of that is the real connection with this kind of tension. This very can be very subtle, the tension in the mind when there is, you know, something that just doesn't align with truth, something that just doesn't align. And so at the, at the heart of what we do as practitioners is learn to be in relationship with all things. Yeah. And this wise relating, we can learn to clarify our relationship, to really feel it, and especially when you know, those, those moments when the feeling that's there is not pleasant. Dukkha's hardly ever, Dukkha's, I mean, I want to say Dukkha's never pleasant because I've never had the <laughs> experience of having pleasant Dukkha. Sometimes it's familiar and sometimes it uh, pulls us, it pulls me in a direction. You know, it can have its own momentum, like, oh, this is regular. I'm supposed to be not feeling great right now, or I'm supposed to be sad about this. Let me see if I can bring on sadness, right? That's, that's not the same thing, is it? So throughout the day today, we can be really curious about our experience with dukkha. What is the experience? How is it 
what is it like to have this body and mind and this mind that relates to the body, right? What's it like to just move through the really ordinary experiences of making food and using the restroom and talking and listening and see if we can relax enough to just watch. What is to watch, right? To not have to resolve anything, but just to be so curious about dukkha that we want to watch and we want to get intimate, right? Setting down any any instinct to to want to blame anybody for the experience of dukkha, but just to be so curious about it that we just want to be with it. It's really hard to learn how to work with any of the unskillful habits of mind if we're not close, right? I've learned this in relationship to anger. There is a kind of a learned habit of trying to avoid anger because there was this view in the mind that anger is not skillful. Well, perhaps that's true that anger is not the most skillful way forward, but without a willingness to get close to anger, I'd, we don't really learn our capacity to be with it as a normal human experience, right? He, anger is a normal human experience. Grief is a normal human experience. They might be confused human experiences, right? And they might come with great intensity, but without learning how to get close, without learning how to feel the intensity that arises in the chest and bubbles out and makes the fingers tingle, without learning how to ride the waves and watch the mind that wants to quickly find someone to condemn, right? The self-righteousness that's there, the sense of self that's like firmly rooted and how hard it is to see around that and make good choices without a willingness to see, oh, wow, anger really pops like this. Then there's just when that human experience, when the conditions are right for that human experience to arise, there's no, there's no developed capacity for, for navigating that skillfully. And at some point, we're all going to have to navigate the most difficult and unskillful places in our lives as we reckon with, you know, as we were chanting about our own, we reckon with the possibility of our own death, death of loved ones, any other really complicated places that we might find ourselves in, we're going to need to rely on something. So what is it that we're going to rely on? Taking a vacation? eating a nice piece of cake or the real sustaining possibility to be okay in the middle of anything. So our connection with dukkha really points us in the direction of this more sustainable happiness. Mark or Meski, anything you'd like to add? Meski, you have something to say? No, I say, great talk. <laughs> All right. So let's see here. We're going to have time for to unpack our experience with Dukkha in small groups. Meski, Mark, and I will uh, each be in one of them. So we'll break up into three groups and one of us will facilitate the group that you're in. Um, and we might just, we might just explore this topic of dukkha and yeah, and, and really what uh, yeah, what, what our experience with dukkha has been. Right? And even because Dukkha is here so often, we might even not have to think back that far. How about this morning when we were rushing or, you know, when we realized we didn't have time to do what we wanted to do or 
the cat suddenly appeared or the technology didn't work or whatever the case, right? So just thinking back to what does that feel like in the body to experience dukkha? What do we, what do we learn about the heart's natural defense mechanisms, about the tendency to deflect, not be intimate with dukkha? And, and more. <laughs> so really anything goes and Mark and Meski and I will probably layer in some support, some of the, some support um, with the teachings to help us move through our experience together. Um, but before that, I'm going to break us into groups. So when you get back to your screen, so we're going to take a 10 minute break right now, uh, a bio break, whatever we need to do to take care of the body. And at 10.45, um, we'll begin the small groups. So I'll put us into groups when you get back to your screen, and I'll use the next eight minutes to put you into groups. So when you get back, there should be a little thing on your screen. You just click on it, and it'll take you there, okay? Please don't leave. <laughs> it will really support all of us if we... If we um, well, if we start by feeling the dukkha of having to talk and listen in small groups, so that could be a good place to begin, right? <laughs> this, these living the practice workshops, um, sometimes we want to just slip into programs. I, I know this um, and just receive and it feels so nice to just not have to engage. And in these living the practice workshops, we really build in a lot of talking so that we can learn from each other and trust the wisdom that's moving in a community like this. So even if you say very little and just show up and receive a little, say your name, you know, even if you just want to pass, it's still a benefit to everybody that you're in the room and helping hold space for this deep and meaningful, really noble work that we're doing together. So please consider staying all the way through. <laughs> all right, friends, we'll see you back in about five minutes now. So uh, as Shelley mentioned, it's, uh, it's not always easy to enter these group sharing situations. And of course, there's always permission to pass. And, uh, but uh, one of the things I think we're probably all realizing over our lives is nobody actually knows the truth. <laughs> but in these really wholesome conversations, we can learn something, we can get a little closer, live in a deeper alignment with the way it is. And in that way, we're like it or not, we're sort of responsible for each other, um, just showing up and being real. And in that way, we illuminate, especially these kinds of deep topics, like what is the truth of dukkha? This, uneasy experience we have in life and how does one realize a more profound release and freedom with dukkha and that's really the topic for these opening conversations so there'll be about 18 people per group with Meski, Shelley and I in each of the three groups and it's a little bit of a sacred space everyone will have a minute or two but not more really, because we're gonna, you know, we just have about 30 minutes for this sharing. So you have a minute or two, just to speak from your heart. What is your actual experience of freedom with difficulty? What have you learned in moments where there was difficulty, pain of loss, physical pain, illness, emotional pain, whatever it might be, where you felt that the way the heart was relating didn't add to the ordinary pain that comes with human life. So what, did, what has our life taught us about ways of relating to the unavoidable ordinary difficulties that come our way? Mental, emotional, physical pain that come our way. How have we related in ways that felt releasing and liberating? How have we related to dukkha in ways that have added other layers, more contraction, more weight, 
more difficulty. So probably just enough time to bring one example to mind. Like Shelley said, it might've happened this morning, might be happening right now. Like for whatever reason, the room I'm in is really cold <laughs> and my hands are cold and my feet are cold. Okay. There are times when I'm unconsciously resisting being cold. And then I can, you know, I see how that just amplifies the uneasiness of my body and mind. And there are other times I'm relaxing with, I, it's still unpleasant, but I'm not constructing someone in opposition to the experience of coldness. And you might want to start by saying your first name, if you feel comfortable and even where you're from and then sharing for a minute or so. And remember, it's okay to pass. Okay, hopefully that's clear enough. I'll pass it back to Shelly. She'll divide us into three groups and we'll arrive there in just a moment. Here you go. Welcome back everyone. I trust your small groups or medium-sized groups really were as good as ours was. And uh, we'll just take a few minutes. It might be nice to hear from one or two people from each of the three groups. Just some theme, some kind of synthesis of the wisdom that you heard in the go around that might be good to speak out to the larger group. That would be really nice. Um, you could, uh, uh, even while someone's speaking, if you want to raise your digital hand, then I'll kind of know. But we'll just take 10 minutes. And uh, how about from Shelley's group? Uh, anybody feel like they can synthesize or there's something that just feels useful to speak out to the larger group from those of you who were in Shelley's group. What we're hearing from people that I think is so useful and it'd be nice to hear from a couple more before time's up, but just we're all like being on this in this workshop together, we're being exposed to all these different experiences of dukkha, these human ordinary unavoidable human experiences. So what's the effect of being in the group hearing these voices, being reminded, yeah. So, one of the things in our small group, can you guys hear me? That I noticed the heart just, pouring in everywhere um, with all the sharing that this dukkha we are talking about, this conditioned existence, this conditioned reality um, even though the mind really personalizes it and makes it mine and this is here it's mine you know it, it just to to brings us to humility and the truth of dukkha and how there is suffering this universality of this condition just spending you know 50 minutes listening to everyone's life is so humbling i, I don't know if there is any other teacher if we were in our own kingdom you know making up all the shit about stuff mine and this is mine and how can this happen and so on we can really see it's happening everywhere and not only it's happening but there is a way to relate to it i was very inspired by all of you sharing it, it is, you know, it's being recognized. That's, Mark always says, uh, when I started back in a day meditation is the moment of mindfulness to recognize that we were lost in something, but then coming back, that moment is a moment of recognition of knowing the stuka. You know, it's not cooperating with it and getting completely lost and you know spinning and adding to the dukkha 
So in the Buddha's teachings, um, the Buddha points out officially the cause of dukkha is ignorance. And I think for many years, possibly, or maybe I, I knew, but then it didn't really land in that, you know, we say like, we even say it as a insult to somebody, so ignorant, right? We, we're not really talking about a degree or um, some sort of uh, learning. So um, what what is ignorance? So the In the discourses, ignorance itself is defined as not knowing dukkha, as not knowing the cessation, the cause of dukkha, what it causes it, as not knowing that it ceases, and not knowing the path. So it's really specific that our outlook and not looking at our experience from this reality of there is dukkha and there is a cause for dukkha. And truly there are duties with all these four noble truths as well. You know, not only just repeating the same thing over and over again, but leaning in and recognizing when we add to it, what's causing it. It's, it's, to me, my own life is like a science experiment. I just, uh, you know, when there was space, ah, when I do this, this happens. Or when I avoid this, this doesn't happen. So just um, really looking in and leaning into the understanding of what creates suffering, not identifying with the suffering, and when possible not to do more of that and, and truly practice towards freedom, not personalizing things. So just to um, this whole dukkha, I was um, doing some reflection and I, I found um, the condition itself. Um, Ajahn Chah, this Thai forest tradition master, um, he puts it in a way um, that I wanna read to you all. Um, he says, no matter if we are delighted or upset, happy or suffering, shading tears or singing songs, never mind living in this world, we are in a cage. We don't get beyond this condition of being in a cage. Everyone, if rich, if, you know, if we are poor, we are living in a cage. If we are singing or dancing, or crying, or if you are watching a movie, we are watching it from this cage. What is this cage? It is a cage of birth, the cage of aging, the cage of illness, the cage of death. In this way, we are imprisoned in this world. Then what do we do? This is mine, that belongs to me. That's how the mind is under understanding this condition. And we don't know what we really are or what we are doing. Actually, all we are doing is accumulating suffering for ourselves when we are not relating in a way that is skillful. So, how do we add and accumulate suffering? You know, moment to moment. In any experience that right at this moment, it could be 
they stalk, it could be the temperature, it could be hunger, it could be anything. Um, we cannot help, it, it is in this condition of frameworks that there is Vedana, which is feeling that whatever we are experiencing, we are either liking the experience, we don't even notice the experience, we are indifferent to it, or we are not liking it. So this three um, experiences come with feeling and we are sensitive beings and we have feelings. So anytime that we are liking something, we are running after it. Anytime that we are not liking something, we don't even notice it. We are bored and um, distracting ourselves or don't remember it's here. Um, and when we hate it, we just cannot wait to get away. So that Vedana underneath that pushes us this way or that way to the liking or not liking creates this craving because we really like something. We crave and long. It could be chocolate. I mean, I can't wait to get a break. If you're going on vacation, it could be any type of craving. Um, we are really running after things. It could be sensual craving. That is experience it with the senses. So that adds to, it fuels this dukkha. And, and you know, we are, we are beings, we have to feed, we are in this, you know, caged existence. So we, it doesn't mean um, we have to like the pain in the back or the knee or we shouldn't really seek food when we are hungry. But a lot of our time is spent <laughs> um, on the mental activity that on what we're gonna eat, we would just think about like, what would be good? What restaurant are we gonna go? And, oh yeah, that's, you know, they don't have the seat. Like there is so much longing one way or another that adds to this fuel. Like we, to our liking or not liking to just, we are slaves to what we like, what we don't like including the experience of dukkha. When there is grief, it is so poignant and it just really comes in and hits the heart. And if we are actually um, discerning, oh yeah, there is, you know, there is dying, there is death, there is aging. If that was a framework, this liking or not liking will ease up a bit versus we just truly wrapped up. I hate this. I just get me out of here. That is a different type of craving. I can't deal with this. It, my bike, I shouldn't be sick. I, as Shelly was so, saying this morning, or why is it this way? So many shoulds or should nots. but we could just look into the craving. Do I just enjoy the food, enjoy the experience, but do I need to actually look and add more craving, more longing to what I'm gonna do when this workshop is done? Like, do I need to do that now? Do I need to fuel my life by longing? could be longing loved ones, it could be, it's, it's been, <laughs> uh, well, I would tell, I would just uh, share a little bit about myself. I, I have been craving to quit my job for like 
years in the making. I think probably the, I've had a corporate job the last 20 years and I don't remember, especially the, I don't know, since I, I started um, deep study that I knew that I need to get out of there. And I was there the whole time. And this, I, I just need to get out of here. This is not the way, right? And then the mind recognizes, listen, the grass is not greener the other side. It doesn't mean that you drop your job or walked away or whatever. It doesn't necessarily mean it's freedom, but I think it became so clear to me that one thing that I want from this life is not today in my to die in my desk. So I did quit my job, which <laughs> was a lot of freedom from that particular dukkha, but dukkha did not stop. You know, there is this new dukkha now that. Well, you did quit your job and you are not doing anything. And what are you doing with it, with your life? You know, there's all this longing to be, to become. And there is this actual hating of this longing. And, and uh, uh, you know, a dukkha on dukkha, you know, on top of that. But I think it's all relative in a way that I, I am grateful and feel privileged that I was able to quit my job and dedicate a little bit more time reflecting on the teachings, just not, you know, really buying the rat race and just getting time to look. So um, it is truly possible to pay attention to the mind in the moment when we are longing and gently to say, oh, that's, that's also creating dukkha. Here's, here I am, you know, trying to become whatever, fill in the blank. And I find myself craving and when there's mindfulness in the next moment, I find myself hating not being wise enough to not understand this craving. So it's, it's a cycle and I'm like, oh, that also is not helping. That's another type of becoming. Or, you know, trying to soothe things with wine or chocolate or Netflix. So um, ignorance and dukkha and craving all related. I don't know how long a time I have. Um, has it been 20 minutes, I think? There's like three minutes left or so. Oh, all right. Well, this is my reflection just in time. Thank you for you for listening. Thank you, Muskie. Thanks, Shelley. Beautiful. So we have more time now for small groups to talk a little bit more about the cause of dukkha and what we notice is the cause of dukkha and in particular how our study of life how our as Meski said she feels like she's would you say a scientist <laughs> something like that in your own life an experiment mm -hmm. experiment yeah your life is an experiment right what our this great experiment called life is all about and how we notice the lawful nature of dukkha Right. Meski was so you know beautifully pointing out that quitting a job might release one kind of dukkha, but 
the dukkha is in the mind and dukkha really doesn't have any preference for what the experience is, right? So another kind of dukkha just fills in the gap. Mm -hmm. yeah, so we get to um, chat about this now. Do we, remind me, Mark or Meski, do we, you think, 20 minutes for small groups, anything else? No, I don't think so. And uh, just that everyone should have a chance to speak. And then there should be five to 10 minutes for open discussion time after every person has a couple minutes to share. Just really give people that space, even if you're holding that space in silence for time as that person continues to reflect. And uh, take some time to introduce yourself right at the beginning. So, and share your pronouns so that you don't accidentally misgender each other. Should I, are we ready to create the groups? Yes. I've got them here all ready to go. Okay. Thanks Mark. Thanks, Mark. We have some time for a large group discussion and just generally, this is the way we flow through these living the practice workshops with uh, a meditation, often a little Dharma, offering and then some small groups to unpack it so we'll keep going in this way throughout the rest of the day so now we have about 15 minutes to share any nuggets of wisdom that arose in your small groups and so anybody can anybody can share again it doesn't have to be it could be anything you know often it's the a little a word or a simple phrase that we retain from programs like this so so it doesn't have to be profound <laughs> i always appreciate that that offering oh shelly it doesn't have to be profound just say something but i'd like to hear something profound too <laughs> <laughs> okay well the profound can rise to the surface also please come forward Yeah, there's a real longing can be a, a uh, really up close and personal look at dukkha and, you know, grief has an aspect of longing to it also, right? So just that willingness to look at the heart that doesn't want to let go and how, um, how often that occurs in so many ways. Thank you. Yeah, there's so many ways to understand dukkha, right? And just sometimes looking at that, like, oh, look at this. Kids do this, adults do this. We do it in different ways, but it makes it seem like, a, it makes the point about suffering being universal make sense. Thank you. It sounds like you're learning how to be engaged in a wholehearted way without uh, clinging to an outcome. Yeah, that's beautiful. Let's see who's taking, oh, I'm, am I taking us to lunch? All right, so we have about an hour for, um, well, it may be lunch for some of you, it may be breakfast for others, it may be um, another kind of break for some as well. So just to encourage uh, an exploration over the, over the next hour, we'll come back at... Um, 120. 120 Central Time, so 55 minutes. And just to, you know, proceed like a, a good experiment, like a good scientist in an experiment called life and just noticing any, any even very small, ordinary tension, constriction, you know, embodied feeling, even if you can't name it and just being willing to pause right there and connect with it and see, see it move. And, and then notice if there's any understanding about, you know, what precipitated that. I don't, I wouldn't go thinking too hard about it, um, analyzing the suffering at all, but just see if there's any obvious cause and effect relationship. 
And that beautiful question that arose in small groups, like what's needed in this moment, sweetie? And that's an opportunity to bring in a little love, right? Soften, right? Soften the heart right there in the, right there with dukkha. And see if there's a way to just continue, um, continue to develop, cultivate the habit of awareness that is non-judgmental and really has no preference for what it's meeting. Right, all oh, this constriction, this tightness. Oh, look at that. A result of wanting things to be resolved, wanting to not be interrupted, um, wanting to eat my meal in peace, or wanting to have broccoli and there's no broccoli. You know, whatever the case is, just noticing that and asking what's needed, what's needed right now to be a little softer, a little more loving with this experience of dukkha, sweetie. And see how that changes uh, how it feels to have a life. <laughs> yeah. Mark, Musky, anything you want to add? No, have a good so. lunch. All right. Have a good, you can just leave your, if you want to leave your, um, your, the Zoom meeting on, you can do that. Just turn your video off. All right. See you soon. So take a moment to settle back in the body with all the sensations from the movement, just uh, allowing your natural rhythm and feel free to take an intentional long breath if that feels comfortable for the body. Close your eyes. And if you if you find it that you feel sleepy, you can slightly open them and not necessarily try to look for seeing, but uh, just to avoid sleep. So we're gonna do a guided meditation. focused on uh, wisdom practice. But just to help us settle in the body mind, we're gonna do a mini meta as well, so relax the body, relax the mind as best possible. And allow the heart to open. And then just to Bring a good wish. May I be safe. May I be healthy. May I be happy. Something gentle and kind, you can replace the words to whatever resonates with you at the moment. This is not some fantasy, but a genuine wish for this being that is here 
at this moment and now. Like everyone else, like we care for a loved one or a child. But may I understand the path to freedom. May I develop skillful qualities that lead to liberation. May I abandon greed, hatred, ill will, delusion, and the qualities of mind that do not lead to liberation. So you can repeat these things for a minute or so. Basically, this phrases, this genuine wish is the object of the meditation itself. So we can bring the awareness to the words and phrases and connect with them. And this gentle goodness and compassion for goodness, for understanding can be extended out to others and when we are not going to do a step-by-step, -step, but we can just invite everyone in the space that loved ones can extend this good wish, this boundless quality of the heart to friends, family, community, to the difficult people, and ultimately to all beings everywhere. May they all be happy, healthy, may they all be safe, May all beings be free. May all beings, without exception, understand the path to freedom.
May they develop skillful qualities that lead to freedom, to liberation. May they abandon ill will, greed, aversion, delusion, Just genuine wish for understanding dukkha, understanding the causes for dukkha, understanding the truths of the cessation of dukkha and the path to liberation. can be extended to all beings and then if uh, the human effort was focused in really exploring and understanding this noble truth is that the Buddha was teaching It likely it would likely make this world a better place for all of us. So in a way, this wish is not necessarily selfish, just for us. It would make our lives better too if we all have space, so. to connect and understand our predicament. So for the remainder part of the meditation, we're going to shift our attention to the body, mind, the heart within. And just recognize what is showing up. This is an open insight meditation. We can ground it to the whole body sitting or the hearing, not necessarily discerning the sound itself, but there is hearing or the breath or whatever the meditation object that comes naturally. We stay grounded there and see and open the heart and mind to discernment, to explore, not necessarily to analyze and think, but Just in the theme of what we have been exploring all day. Is there dukkha? Just discern 
there is any holding in the body, there is any holding in thinking, there is any feeling that's held tightly. You can see what the dukkha is. Just to be open. And if there is no dukkha, you can be interested in the freedom, in the release from not having dukkha, the space. The quality of this, allowing things to be. And in the next moment, we may, we may see the body-mind picking up some other object and getting tight. And we can see and observe the craving, the longing that may have caused it or whatever the case might be, that the fear that brought it. You can discern back to see if that's needed. What if it is possible to put it down? And in moments it's released, we can also notice the causes in so many tiny ways. Sometimes it's just the awareness itself that's needed. Oh, my shoulders were tight, so I can put this down. You can notice the subtle ways and the big ways that get tight. And what the cause is. and uh, seizing of the tightness as the causes are released or abundant. In this investigation, we can overall discern our relationship with dukkha and how we can practice each moment, each moment with what's here, with our input, whether it is grasping or aversion or allowing your acceptance, recognizing the whole gamut. You don't even have to look elsewhere. Right 
in each breath, in each moment. Discernment into what is here. Continue in silence.
Thank you for your practice. You can take a stretch. Uh, Mark will do the a talk next. Thanks, Pesky. Mark Alcacity. Yeah, mm -hmm. thanks so much for the nice set. Yeah, first, so for, feel free to stand for just a few seconds if you need to and stretch your arms and legs, whatever your body could use. And no rush, but when you feel ready, just settle back in. Okay, so you probably see somewhat of the rhythm of the day where um, our discussion earlier in the morning and Shelley's talk earlier in the morning is really about just having a more honest, clear, sensitive acknowledgement of the truth of dukkha, that there is dukkha, there are, there are difficulties, uncertainties. And then um, with Mesky's talk and then the small groups afterward, we're really, as we have a more honest, grounded relationship to dukkha, then we can have this discovery, which I'm assuming we all have to some degree that dukkha is lawful, it's conditional, it comes and goes according to causes and conditions, and we're not helpless. We get to participate, or another way of saying that is it really matters how we relate to dukkha. And then today, this afternoon, you know, what I'm going to talk about, and then after I'm done, we'll have small groups again. So it's kind of the maturing of us studying, being more intimate, being more interested, using that frame, suffering and the end of suffering as we live our life, just the ordinary activity of our lives, something begins to mature, like as I more regularly participate am close to suffering, I know how to relate, how to participate, how to open in a way that is liberating. So we're going to be, I'll talk about that and, and, uh, and then we'll have small groups. And it's, it's kind of a, a bit of an affront, isn't it? Like when the Buddha says, I teach only one thing, suffering and the end of suffering. And, you know, our our response is, well, easy for you to say, or something like that. You know, when anybody tells us that there's an end to suffering, to whatever degree we're feeling oppressed or we're feeling cornered by difficult circumstances in life, it always feels a little bit, if it's not done right, it really feels a little insulting. Because then we feel like a failure. Well, I must be a failure if I'm still suffering, because the Buddha says, there's an end to suffering. And I don't know that end. So what, what does that make me? A failure <laughs> or something like that. It, it, can, it can really be a setup. And um, so what do we do about that? I think Meske mentioned in their talk, um, this basic teaching from the Buddha that the cause for suffering, our personal subjective suffering, is the not understanding the nature of the experience of suffering. We just haven't been close enough, relaxed enough, stable enough, curious enough, compassionate enough to really understand the second arrow of suffering. Because the Buddha never said there isn't pain in life. That isn't what the Buddha means when he says, I teach suffering in the end of suffering. He's really talking about the suffering that arises because we don't like the ordinary pain that comes with life. The pain of loss, the pain of betrayal, the pain of aging and bodily aches, the pain of oppression. That is what the practice is about. It doesn't change 
that life is uncertain, that life is insecure, that anything can happen. One of the things I like about my job is, you know, the wise teaching just seem to show up. So one of the people I read regularly online is Maria Popova. I don't know if anybody knows. She has a wonderful blog called the Marge, Margin, Margin Alien. I think something like that. But she's a writer and critic and I guess philosopher and just has a great blog that I've been reading for years. And in this more recent one that got sent out in January, she's uh, talking about a philosopher named Martha Nussbaum and a really wise person. And besides being a philosopher, she's really interested in Greek tragedies. And it's, it's sort of the basis of her work. She really likes stories and just the nature of how humans have used tragedy. And she really, in a powerful way for me, and I think very much in line with the Buddhist teachings, equates um, embracing, inhabiting, embodying tragedy as a way of understanding being free with dukkha, which is really the theme of our, of our day to day. So let me just read a little bit of this. And um, she's drawing from this interview that Bill Moyers, you know, he did a, a series, if you don't remember, Bill Moyers was a uh, way, way back. He was, I think, the press secretary for Lyndon Johnson. And then he became, for a long, long time, uh, did documentaries and interviews on um, public television. And uh, one of the things he's known best for is the interview he did with Joseph Campbell. Some of you probably saw that. If you haven't, it's, it's really worth watching. I'm sure it's on YouTube somewhere. But he also did a series of just uh, interesting interviews with interesting people, Houston Smith and many others, including this woman, Martha Nussbaum. And so she, met, like I mentioned, she, she's talking about, as a philosopher, the importance of stories, not just the sort of you know, language of uh, analysis, abstraction. And uh, this uh, person writes, reflecting on the timeless wisdom of the Greek myths and tragedies, Nussbaum considers the essence of good personhood, which necessitates accepting the basic insecurity of existence and embracing uncertainty. So she responds to Moyer's question this way. The condition of being good is that it should always be possible for you to be morally destroyed by something you couldn't prevent. To be a good human being is to have a kind of openness to the world, an ability to trust on certain things beyond your own control. That can lead you to be shattered in, in very extreme circumstances for which you were not to blame. That says something very important about the human condition, the ethical life, that it is based on a trust in the uncertain, in the uncertain and on a willingness to be exposed. It's based on being more like a plant than a jewel, something rather fragile, but whose very particular beauty is inseparable from its fragility. And then uh, Maria writes here, the woman who runs the blog, the paradox of the human condition, Nussbaum reminds us, is that while our capacity for vulnerability and by extension, our ability to trust others may be what allows for tragedy to befall us, the greatest tragedy, tragedy of all is the attempt to guard against hurt by petrifying that essential softness of the soul for that denies us our basic humanity. All right, so this is the place, you know, in terms of really clarifying our own experience. And this is what we'll talk about in the small group. You know, what is our experience of release? Now there's the, there's a sort of more accessible release that we experience when all the conditions in our life are relatively okay. And we're sitting in the bathtubs, bathtub, and we got nice smells, 
and nice music, you know, and the water's the right temperature, and we can feel relatively at ease. But what is our experience of being at ease when things aren't going the way we want them to go? How have we uncovered, even accidentally uncovered, a sense of relief, of release, of space, of freedom, of non-fear, of ease, in the push and pull of relationship. For example, those of you who are raising teens or children, those of you who are in intimate relationships with a partner or several partners for that matter, or those of you who are you know, navigating a breakup or who are falling in love or who are activists trying to speak truth to power or kind of address things that are embedded in our institutions that really need to change but are not so conducive to change. So whatever place, however we might be bumping up against what hurts, how do we find that release the non, not the heart not being burdened by the tragedy of life. And I really like this lens that uh, freedom isn't about escaping the messiness of life. It's about finding this space that we're not attached to perf perfection, but we're not attached to giving up our engagement are leaning in, are showing up. So the freedom is in the, you know, we almost need these messy places. They, uh, this woman, uh, this philosopher, um, Martha Nussbaum, gives the example of something really ordinary between, let's say, your career and being available for your kid, you know, and and normally just that tension actually can make being a parent more poignant that you're also trying to have a career. And it can make having a career more poignant that you're actually trying to raise a kid. And sometimes they just won't, inevitably, they just won't work together. Like you're gonna sacrifice being a good parent or you're gonna sacrifice being a good employee. You can't do both. It just isn't possible to do both. And it kind of breaks our heart wide open, hopefully. And it, it actually can be terrible suffering if we think it shouldn't be that way. I shouldn't be cornered by life and have to choose between being a good parent and being a good activist or a good employee or a, you know, a good friend. Why do I have to choose? But that really, I think, says something about what freedom feels like and looks like in our life. So in the small groups, you know, you might be inclined to share moments, and it's totally fine to share moments where you really noticed a lot of space, a lot of freedom, and that freedom, that space, that release was really a function of having really suitable, wonderful conditions. It's good to know that, that sort of, oh yeah, I feel pretty at ease. I feel pretty equanimous, but it's because there's nothing difficult right now. But at least that teaches us what the feeling of the heart being unburdened is, right? We want to know, oh yeah, my heart's not burdened right now. I, can, I feel safe. I feel like I can be open because it's safe. Then we, we use those experiences to get a flavor, to remember that flavor of being undefended and open. And then we use that to get curious, like, well, how about having that same openness, even when I'm faced with a difficult choice, and there's really no perfectly right answer in terms of what I choose to do. I mean, I feel this way every time I go shopping for groceries. Do I buy eggs or not? You know, do I purchase something that's wrapped in plastic or not? I mean, it, it never ends for me. Like, and I'm assuming it's true for many of us, just in that simple weekly activity of shopping for groceries, let alone all the other choices. Do I buy products made in China? Or do I, you know, 
Is it okay for me to spend money on myself in this way? Is it morally right for me to have retirement savings? These are, for me, unanswerable questions. I don't pretend to know the answer to any of these questions. And then the question is, so am I going to um, use all of this ambiguity, all this uncertainty to suffer? Because <laughs> I certainly can. You know, it's like judge myself for being, if not fitting some ideal that I've either borrowed from some other person or I've constructed myself. Like a good person doesn't eat eggs or a good person, you know, doesn't have savings because there are people who don't have enough to eat. There's something about this full catastrophe of being a human being that um, really supports the movement towards wisdom and love, wisdom and compassion, not avoiding the mess, but really using it. And it, it has, it really um, allows for two things that are very trustworthy a wiser participation, a wiser engagement in our life, as opposed to, you know, blaming life or retreating from life, wanting to get revenge on how life doesn't work, you know, blaming life for being imperfect. So it allows for a more full engagement, a more creative and useful engagement in life. And it allows for the body, the heart and the mind to be more and more released and unafraid. So she goes on to talk about uh, Martha Nussbaum, about being on the lookout for these tragedies in our life because we'll get a deeper sense of what freedom with suffering looks like and feels like when we, these particularly particular sticky, ambiguous places where we can't do everything, where how we should respond isn't that clear to us. But just because it's not clear, it doesn't make sense to dismiss that I should engage, I, I should show up in some way. So let me just read a little from Ajahn Sumedho before we do our small groups. And this is from um, a really wonderful book called The Mind and the Way by Ajahn Sumedho. He's an American, but he's been a Buddhist monk for a long, long time now. And he's in his mid to late 80s. I think he's been a monastic for um, close to 50 years now. And is somewhat retired in terms of being in charge of monasteries, but still doing a little teaching. You can catch him on YouTube of uh, different places. But this is the end of his book, and he's, he's really sort of summing up the Buddhist teachings. So he writes, right view, the right way of seeing things, is a completely fearless way because it is infinite. And I would, you know, maybe instead of using the word infinite, I would say it's unfixed. He continues writing, it is eternal. It is something truly grand and miraculous because we can't perceive it. All we can do is open to it. Open the mind to the unknown, the mystery. This can be terrifying. <clears throat> the religious experience is often described as a terrible one, which means that it is terrifying. It is taking away, pulling away everything that we identify with and depend on. Everything you feel, uh, everything you feel safe and comfortable with. Suddenly it is all removed, ripped away from you, and you're left with nothing. But the marvelous thing about it is that when you accept it, 
That is where you find true peace. It is truly peaceful to be completely open, totally vulnerable and alert to the mystery of the unknown. And a little bit later, he writes, we think we've got to make ourselves so strong that no one will dare attack us. But that attitude depends, demands endless propping up, doesn't it? And our defenses inevitably fail us. We can look mean and flex our muscles a bit, but we can't stand with muscles flexed all the time. We have to relax. And when we do, somebody can catch us in a position in which we are quite vulnerable. All the defenses we can build are no protection against the unknown. So even, you know, Buddhism as a spiritual practice, it isn't, we're not looking for somebody to save us. We're really in opening to the truth of insecurity and vulnerability and uncertainty. We're really resolving that sense of somebody crying out, please help me. It's, it's a very powerful kind of spiritual maturing that I can come into alignment with life as it is. And we discover there a freedom that is very surprising. A little bit more before I pass it to Meski to introduce the small groups. One can't really perceive the whole vast universe in a clear way. One can only open to it. Ordinarily, human consciousness is limited to the perceptions we have through our senses. It's very difficult for us to catch glimpses beyond that. But the more we let go of our grasping of the sensory world, the less we hold on to it and identify with it, the more we begin to have glimpses of deathlessness. The word deathlessness is used in the early Buddhist tradition. Synonyms would be the unconditioned or the way it is or the kind of essential emptiness of self-centeredness, you could say. the more we have, begin to have glimpses of the deathlessness, we begin to experience Amaravati, the deathless realm, the underlying unity, the overlying compassion, the whole wondrous miracle. It is part of the human condition that in spite of our obvious limitations as individual creatures, we have an ability to comprehend the whole but that comprehension comes not from the perception of the whole, but from the opening of the heart. We are not just trying to believe in the perception of wholeness that we hold as a doctrine. We're going to the very experience of wholeness as we open the heart. This is fearlessness. It is the willingness to be hurt, to be totally sensitive, and to bear with the pain, despair, and confusion of our sensory experience. So this is how we understand and ultimately experience freedom by being more real with our ordinary experience of being a sensitive human being, bumping in to the, you know, the push and pull of our likes and dislikes and all the little and big betrayals that just come with human existence. So I'll, I'll leave it to Meski to introduce the small groups that we'll do next. Thanks, Mark. Um. Many years ago on retreat was, can you guys hear me? Um, with Mark, I, I recall this, uh, vaguely recall this, um, this quote that Mark shared with us. 
uh, the definition of enlightenment from this uh, Jesuit priest. Um, Mm. like a cooperation with the inevitable like it's it's not necessarily um, something we go and get something and you know become x or y but just accepting and allowing and you know, willfully cooperating with what is ungovernable. Um, so we're going to have about 30 minutes and, and Shelly will divide us in small groups uh, of five or so. So in the team of this um, whole day exploring Dukkha, um, in a small groups, um, possibly one of the things that we may want to share is this release. Um, even though we focus a lot about, you know, the truth of Dukkha itself, we all had overcome something before. And we have our direct experience of that dukkha passing. But the mind is most of the time tries to make something up and really, you know, more interested in this, you know, hurt and pain um, and less attention is given to the release. So we have to bring him up to mind that there was, there is also impermanence was what is showing up and what seemed so real and ready to swallow us. You know, when we are willing to open our hearts, be um, willing to get close to the heartbreak, that even that heartbreak passes and it does not kill us. So those are a few of the um, reflection points that you can point to and, and share uh, the causes that we learned in this release, you know, and the burden too, when we pick it up and carry it. Just I, I notice in my own shoulders, it's like, well, look, I must have been carrying it, just taking a breath and then just brings it down. It's this uh, angst that we unconsciously carry. And then we just really do a deep, deep breath from the diaphragm and then the body really releases itself. So in small ways and big ways, there is release. And we can consciously pay attention to the cessation and the release and reflect on what allowed the release. So Shelly, you can divide us up in the small groups. I think this, this time um, it's only, there isn't going to be a teacher. So it's maybe a group of five or so. I'm ready. All right. I'll send you there. You'll have 20, 25 minutes and I'll give you a five minute warning. So we settle into our bodies and our sensitive hearts, whatever you're feeling, even if that feeling is a feeling of numbness in your heart or the feeling nothing's happening, that's a feeling too. And learning how to embrace and how to relax and 
how to trust whatever it is we're feeling in the body and feeling in the heart and noticing as activity of the mind. And as a way of honoring um, Thich Nhat Hanh, this very beautiful and wise Vietnamese Buddhist monk who passed away recently, last night or yesterday rather, this is a poem he wrote way back, 1989, I think, that uh, really powerful poem. It's called, Please Call Me By My True Names. And for me, this poem really speaks to the, the freedom with dukkha and that this freedom with dukkha is this beautiful blending of wisdom and compassion. So here's the poem by Thich Nhat Hanh. <clears throat> Don't say that I will depart tomorrow. Even today, I am still arriving. Look deeply. Every second I am arriving to be a bud on the spring branch, to be a tiny bird with still fragile wings learning to sing in my new nest, to be a caterpillar in the heart of a flower, to be a jewel hiding in a stone. I still arrive in order to laugh and to cry, to fear and to hope. The rhythm of my heart is the birth and death of all that is alive. I am the mayfly metamorphosing on the surface of a river, and I'm the bird that swoops down to swallow the mayfly. I am the frog swimming happily in the clear water of a pond, and I am the grass snake that silently feeds itself on the frog. I am the child in Uganda, all skin and bones, my leg as thin as bamboo sticks. And I am the arms merchant selling deadly weapons to Uganda. I am the 12 year old girl refugee on a small boat who throws herself into the ocean after being raped by a sea pirate. And I'm the pirate, my heart not yet capable of seeing and loving. I am a member of the Politburo with plenty of power in my hands, and I'm the man who has to pay his debt of blood to my people, dying slowly in a forced labor camp. My joy is like spring, so warm, it makes flowers bloom all over the earth. My pain is like a river of tears, so vast it fills the four oceans. Please call me by my true names so I can hear all my cries and all my laughter at once. So I can see that my joy and pain are one. Please call me by my true names so I can wake up and so the door of my heart can be left open, the door of compassion. So we'll have the link for you um, for that poem if, in case you want it. But we'll just settle into our meditative space, recognizing this very simple but powerful truth that it isn't easy being a human being. It isn't easy having a body, having a sensitive heart, having a mind, a heart that's been conditioned by culture, imperfectly, of course. And yet, it's like this now for each of us, this sitting body, this sensitive heart feeling what it feels, this imagining mind making stuff up thinking about this and that, all that's moving here and now in the space of our lives, right here, right now. 
It isn't easy being a human being. And I care enough to be close. I care enough to learn how to feel what's ever here now to feel. Not to be afraid to feel what's here to feel. And I care enough to notice this movement of real love, real compassion. May this heart find its way. May real wisdom and love protect and guide me. And I learn, may I learn how to be at ease with the conditions of my life. May I learn how to express real ease with the conditions of my life, no matter how it is. So one way or another, each of us, each of us in our own way, we're just arousing this capacity we know is here, this capacity to care, to love, to wish well for this life. I no longer am willing to be distant, to be disconnected. I resolve to stay close because I care. And I care enough to have this simple wish that I can keep coming back to. May this body, this heart and mind be at ease, no matter the conditions. Happy and at ease, no matter the twists and turns of this life. And just as I wish this for myself, I remember, I sense that everybody here with us in the program, all our friends, all the dear ones in our lives, all of our acquaintances, everybody cares about their own life. And in the same way, I care about everybody's life, knowing that everybody wishes to be safe wishes to be at ease, wishes to navigate their lives with ease and happiness. So let's do our best to sense the generosity, this expansive, generous, loving, tender quality of the heart and mind right here and now. The heart that has the capacity to welcome and include and not be afraid. Like a generous and compassionate smile that isn't put off by the actuality of our world, the messiness, the meanness. How hate and ignorance operates. Love isn't confused by the reality on the ground because it understands this is how it is. All these causes and conditions, all this confusion, all these vortexes of hate and ignorance, greed and ignorance. When it's like this, when it looks like this, it feels like this. And I care. I care enough to stay close. And I care enough to relate in this generous way. May we all find ways to relate to the suffering in our lives with wisdom and love. 
May we all find our way toward release and ease, no matter the conditions. And we're going to practice abiding in the goodness of compassion as if we can actually lean back, not physically, of course, but the heart leans back and trusts the capacity, the goodness of compassion and wisdom, the quality of the heart or the capacity of the heart that can say yes to everything, doesn't need the world, the internal or external world to be different than it actually is now. Like a beautiful and generous smile, tenderness, that really knows how to be right in the middle without fear, without greed, without hate. May we all be at ease. So we're gonna continue on our own for 10, 15 minutes, something like that. Just find your way back. If you need to go back to just working with your own heart, great. Don't be afraid to start over. But to the extent that you can really abide and rest in this boundless wisdom and compassion, this great space of love, openness, where everything's included, As the Buddha taught, I will abide pervading the all-encompassing world, all directions above and below, everywhere and every way. I will abide with this heart in, imbued with compassion, this generous and boundless exalted, immeasurable love, free from hostility and ill will, I will abide.
we'll sit for another couple minutes. And even if the meditation time has felt imperfect to you or the mind's been distracted or whatever it's been like, maybe there's a way to open the heart, open the mind, to be at ease with being an imperfect meditator, living an imperfect life, Maybe the love and the hope in us itself can be a thing of beauty. Or the non-fear with being a human being can be a thing of beauty, of the flavor of freedom. So we're not trying to have a perfect life. We're trying to, right in this moment, be present in a way that is truly good and truly open, empty of burdensomeness, empty of fear. So is this possible right now for a moment? to be here, to be relating, to be opening in a way that has a real f the real flavor of ease and compassion and wisdom here and now the way it is. I'll pass it to Shelley, but just again a reminder that I put in the chat for those who would like a copy of that wonderful poem by Thich Nhat Han. That's in the chat now, as well as um, uh, the link for supporting the teachers and the center. It's been a <clears throat> lovely day of practice together. We have about 20 minutes left. We thought we'd use the time to um, share reflections about the learning that's taken place and maybe any resolutions that have come out of today, aspirations. And also, it could be a time to ask questions of Mark, Meski, and I, if you have, if you have those, and we'll just take turns. So you can just continue to raise your virtual hand the way you have been, and we'll see what happens. Well. Well, maybe I'll, I'll say a word or two, but this might be a, a Mark question, um, ultimately. But I think of, in generally, I, at least in my experience, um, it's not so much about good and bad in Buddhism. But we can think about dukkha like compost, right? It's just what's going to support learning. And ultimately, that's what we're here to do, is to learn, is to understand and grow and understanding or wisdom is what's liberative. So if we want to understand deeply, right, if we want to understand the deepest truths that the Buddha taught and experience the deepest freedom, then it's really often in these moments of these small moments where we can taste freedom that we get a sense of what it's like to be um, unhindered more often. So dukkha provides that opportunity. So it's also, you know, important to remember that every, 
you know, our life and in, in all of all of our moments of intentionality, they all matter. So we don't want to get like tight about that. Like, oh, everything matters. I better, you know, be so careful that I forget that I'm participating even when I'm still. <laughs> right. Or like, you know, I've said sometimes, even if we locked ourselves in a closet for seven years, it would be a kind of participation. So we don't get a pass, right? Mm -hmm. Just by avoiding. That's a kind of participation that yields an impact. And we can notice this in simple ways, like if we choose to speak or choose to not speak, it has an impact on the conversation, right? Like in a, in a relationship. And so it can be good to remember like moments of re reactivity really matter. It matters how we meet them. Those moments of dukkha matter. It matters how we meet them. And so clarifying a useful or skillful relationship to dukkha has, a, has an important impact that we don't want to forget. But I'm wondering what Mark or Meski might add to that. Well, I did uh, a quote from Sharon Salzberg came to mind that uh, I find really helpful. I often repeat it. You might have even heard me say it before, Catherine, but uh, it's near the beginning of Sharon's wonderful book on loving kindness, The Revolutionary Art of Happiness, which is, you know, written a long time ago now, but still just a really, I think, important book about this aspect of her practice. But somewhere near the beginning of that book, she says, you know, it's not that suffering is redemptive in itself. It isn't. Suffering is suffering. <laughs> dukkha is dukkha. It's unpleasant, basically, if not, you know, terribly unpleasant. But opening to suffering is redemptive. So the thing about suffering that's relevant is it's like a teacher, like Shelley was saying, it's an it's a essential teacher because when we resist suffering and we watch or see that, we learn about the cause for it because that's the cause for suffering is the not fully understanding it. And because we don't fully understand suffering, we relate to it in ways that add more suffering. So it's a powerful teacher. But when we open to it, when we have an honest, relaxed, fearless relationship, so in a way, there's no way to freedom. We need exposure to dukkha to realize the freedom that's available in our life. I mean, maybe it's possible for people to realize, to really wake up to the deepest wisdom without a lot of dukkha in their life. But generally, it's through being close, being intimate, being relaxed with dukkha that people realize with has always been there, but and and what that is is it's like realizing we don't have to grip. We can participate without the grip of fear, the grip of greed, the grip of hate. Thanks for the good question, Catherine. Meski, do you wanna take that one? Um, sure. So, you know, it's part of the condition when, when dualistic view is part of the conditioning. Um, for a majority of, you know, Abrahamic tradition where it's good, it's bad pretty much maybe for all of humanity we've been conditioned like you know how we train children it's good or bad good or bad and no other alternative in a way like is it the on is is the only way looking at life is good or bad good people bad people <laughs> and when we explore a lot of times um, topics about you know racism or workshops about anti-racism it's like i'm a good person you know i'm not racist 
um, kind of situation comes up a lot, but it's another dukkha that our conditioning itself, um, our, like you say, Tim, our outlook completely goes to this happened to me because it must be that I'm a bad person. I have cancer or I have cancer or this is happening to me. It is not looking at the way things are. In the Buddhist teachings, the Buddha is simply saying, there is suffering. <laughs> Ultimately, when we think about 500 years ago, everyone that lived is no longer here. Was it it's car accident or cancer or world or one or two? I, you know, it is the condition we are in. But we can add additional suffering by, you know, personalizing it and, and you know, thinking it's because of this. And it's personally for me, it's been a struggle just to divorce that type of outlook like I don't it, you know does this help or not like am I adding something by this outlook so just deeply reflecting on dukkha itself really kind of removes this whole additional things there is skillful and unskillful things that we can do and look at versus this is bad or I'm bad or um, or you know all these great things happen to me because I'm great but there is a teaching of karma within the Buddhist teachings that covers what we our contribution of what is lawful what comes to mind so Thanks, Miski. It sounds just right to me. And it makes sense that we all sound, are echoing something similar. We've all been students of Marx for a very long time. <laughs> and students of the Buddha. <laughs> oh, of course. <laughs> Mark, do you want to jump in? Yeah, I, uh, yeah, I do. Thanks. Um, yeah, it's such an important question. And because uh, we, we think that uh, we need a stance in order to be a good human being, like to address the kind of systemic suffering around racism or class or other kinds of economic injustice that exists or how we're taking care of the planet. But the wisdom of being with dukkha, you know, being with dukkha with compassion and wisdom, it's not a fixed stance. It's the absence of a fixed stance. So that's, that's an interesting, that gives us like a hint of what we're looking for. What would it be like to be open and sensitive? Like Charles Lee was just talking about, like really um, having a different relationship to that sensitivity to suffering. But, but not knowing much, but knowing that the direction I'm going in is not a fixed stance. Because passivity would be a fixed stance, like, I don't know what the hell to do. So, you know, I'm going to, I'm not going to contribute, but I, I'm not, but to sort of allow sensitivity to do what it's going to do. We'll feel moved to respond, to speak up, to turn left, to turn right, to do a backflip because we don't have a fixed stance. We're not pretending that we're supposed to know the right way. All we know is I trust sensitivity and I definitely trust uh, that it doesn't work to ignore my sensitivity of the body, of the heart, of the mind. So that openness, and this is, it has to be sort of experienced to, to be believed that it's actually helpful, that being open actually is practically functionally uh, practically functional in all the different arenas of our life we have to actually check it out does it work to be 
more and more open. Thanks for the great question, Patty, or comment. And so we'll leave it here now. And just to reiterate what, what Mark has posted in the chat about the way things work at Common Ground. Common Ground has operated on generosity and donations since its inception. All of the programs are offered freely in the spirit of generosity. Everything, our residential retreats, online programs and person programs, it's really a beautiful thing. And when teachers show up to teach, they offer, um, we offer it generously without any strings attached, without any expectations. And uh, for Mark and I, we are staff teachers, so uh, we we receive a salary and teaching is a part of our uh, complete duties and responsibilities at Common Ground. And for most other teachers, including Mesky, Mes uh, teachers receive a portion of the Donna that's offered during that program. So if you contribute today, if you offer some financial donation that you, you would like to um, by using the online system that was posted in the chat, then Mesky will get a third of that, uh, a third of the donations. Typically teachers get, oh wait, my math might be off. Teachers receive two thirds of the donations, Common Ground keeps a third, so I don't know the math, but that's, the three of us would get two thirds total, so people who know math know that. And Mes Mesky will receive a portion of your donations, okay. <laughs> I hope that was clear. And if it's not clear, please, I really welcome questions. So does Mark, Meski, all of the teachers. We welcome questions. It can be um, confusing to understand. So even if you've heard it once or twice or many times, reach out. And a couple of announcements. Uh, there's a mindfulness and physical pain workshop. Ramesh Sairam, one of our Dharma teachers, will be leading that the first Saturday in February. I think it's the 4th or the 5th. And it hasn't been offered in a while, so um, and he, he felt moved to offer it now. So if it's something that you're interested in, it's been a really popular workshop, I would encourage you to consider it. Then I'll be leading a, a day-long retreat at the end of the month, I think the last Saturday in February. And lots, lots more going on. Rebecca Bradshaw will be here on Wednesday, the first week in February as well, leading that program for us ahead of the TCBC retreat. Any questions about program offerings coming up or Donna or anything else before we close? Yeah, and there's a day long this coming Saturday too, a week from today. Oh, great. Mark, you're leading that? I think so, yeah. <laughs> great. <laughs> and I just wanted to say to everybody, um, truly what a, you know, a gift just for the community and each other to spend the day reflecting on dukkha. It's been worthy effort. So thank you everybody for your practice. Well, heartedly agree. Thanks friends. Have a wonderful rest of your weekend. <laughs>